first thing I want to say is that this is for educational purposes and doesn't replace any need to see a medical professional or medical advice that you receive. I'd like to thank Rama for inviting me to make this short podcast about pain and specifically some of the points to do with chronic pain in diabetes and I hope to make some more podcasts if this is received positively. So we've all experienced pain at some point in our lives and this quote summarizes things quite nicely I thought from Seneca the philosopher suffering tests brave men. The part of the body that deals with pain is the nervous system so I thought the first thing to do was to explain the various parts of the nervous system. So if we look at the illustration on the left, we have two pictures. We have a central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord. That's the central computer of the body. And then we have the peripheral nervous system. Periphery means everything else. So that means the arms and the legs and the nerves to the organs and the skin and so on. I always think of this as the iPhone or the Android is the brain and the connecting cable are the nerves that go either to the phone or from the phone. If we have a nerve that goes to the brain, it's called a sensory nerve. And if we have a nerve that goes from the brain to a muscle, that's called a motor nerve. You'll hear doctors and clinicians talk about two types of pain, and that is acute and chronic. Chronic pain is long-term pain which the body can't deal with, can't get rid of. It causes lots of other problems, depression, anxiety, refusal to move or fear of movement. That's called kinesophobia. Whereas acute pain is the kind of pain that you would experience if you banged your leg on a table or if you had an injection in your arm. It's very short-lived. The pain might be quite intense, but it doesn't last very long and it doesn't really change us as a person. One of the problems with chronic pain is that eventually it becomes a bigger problem than the reason that we have pain, which is to try and protect us. So in summary, acute pain hurts you and chronic pain really changes you in every way. Here's another slightly more complex diagram to illustrate the way that the nervous system is divided. So we can divide the nervous system into a voluntary nervous system and an involuntary or an autonomic or automatic nervous system. The voluntary nervous system is the thing that we are aware of, the sensations that we feel, the movements that we make, the fact that we move around and smell things, see things and so on. Equally important is the autonomic nervous system, but we don't know that that's doing anything. So again, if we use the analogy of a a mobile phone, I don't particularly need to know that my mobile phone is running programs in the background, updating itself, doing a virus check, but it's important. So that's what the autonomic nervous system does. That keeps things like our respiration, blood pressure, blood sugar levels normal, and that's the autonomic nervous system and that's further subdivided into the parasympathetic and the sympathetic and they work opposite to each other one of them gets us ready to take action and one gets us ready to kind of go to sleep and prepare ourselves for recovery here's a definition of pain so as we know it's an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience there is emotion attached to the sensation of pain and it's associated with either actual or potential tissue damage Uh, and that's a definition from the International Association for the Study of Pain. The important thing here to note is that there is an emotional component to how we deal with pain and pain is supposed to be a protective mechanism. It's supposed to protect us from the dangers and traumas that we subject ourselves to every day. When I started my career as a clinician, I got quite upset by the amount of pain that I was seeing in people. And I remember coming home and thinking, why do we have pain? What's the benefit of pain? The answer is that pain is very important for our survival. 
So there is a very rare genetic condition called CIP, which stands for congenital insensitivity to pain. And if a baby has this, you would think that it would make you into a superhero. Batman, Superman, Spider-Man, Wonder Woman. It doesn't. It's actually life-threatening because the baby doesn't learn from its experiences. If you trap your hand in a door, you won't do it again. You learn from that experience. And next time you go to the door, you'll be very careful. If you eat food which is very spicy and you don't like it, you'll learn from that and you won't eat it again. If you don't feel pain, you don't learn from these experiences. And these children that have this condition tend to get infections. They even bite their own skin. They bite their own fingers because they're tasty and they don't feel pain. They never learn from the experience. So even though pain is a dreadful thing and we want to rid ourselves of pain, pain in its most basic sense is there to warn us of things. The problem is that quite often the pain itself becomes a problem and stops us from doing things and that's when it becomes a problem to us. Pain is different at different times in our lives and different people and it can change day to day. So for example if you have a child who is very sick and you have a headache you will ignore the headache and you will deal with the sick child and then once you've sorted out the sick child the headache will come back and then you'll process your own pain. So we can moderate or modulate the pain. You'll come across the term modulation a lot. It just means how we adapt and deal and change the pain that we feel. I thought it was important just to give you an example of how we use pain to protect ourselves. So on the next page I have a graphic of a reflex arc. It looks a bit complex to start with, but I'm going to try and talk you through it step by step. So if we start at the top left of this diagram, this is what happens when somebody pricks you with a needle or gives you an injection. The tissues are damaged, the nerves, the sensory nerves in the skin and the tissues underneath pick that up as a problem. They send impulses down a nerve, which is blue in this case, into the back of the spinal cord, that's the main cable that runs from the brain down the back of our spines. The nerve impulse actually goes into the spinal cord and then ends. There's then a junction, a connection, another neuron called an interneuron, which then sends nerve impulses to different places. One of the things that it does is it sends a nerve impulse back to where it came from on a different nerve to a muscle. And if this is your fingertip, the muscle in question will be one near your finger. So you'll withdraw your finger from the needle to protect yourself. At the same time, there may be other muscles being contracted as well to move your arm out of the way. And also there will be nerve impulses going up to your brain to tell you what's just happened, to inform you of the potential damage to your skin from the needle. One of the parts of the brain that we now know is important in how we deal with pain is this part of the brain called the limbic system. It's called the emotional nervous system and that's a very busy part of the brain and it can be affected by other things which is why it's important that we try to do things that we enjoy as a way of dealing with pain. I'm often asked are there certain types of people that deal with pain better than others? Do men feel pain less than women? Do women cope with pain better than men? That's a tricky one to answer. On a physiological level, the point at which a person will feel pain is the same. So if we do an experiment where we create some kind of device that will cause pressure to our skin or a fingernail on 50 people or 100 people, when we get to the same pinch pressure, everybody will say at the same point, yes, that is now painful. So everyone has the same pain threshold. What differs is how we tolerate that pain. Some people are able to tolerate pain and compartmentalize it and deal with it in a better way than others. And again, this is partly related to what else is going on in our lives. The things that cause pain in our bodies are broadly broken down into two different aspects. There's mechanical pressure or swelling 
and chemical irritation. So, for example, if we have a slip disc, and I know I hope to talk to you in the future about slip discs or prolapse discs, there is a physical pressure from the disc on a nerve which causes pain, but there's also a chemical reaction around that which is irritable and causes pain as well. So there's a mechanical and a chemical pain. And these two types of pain combine to give you your pain, which is a, a very individual, personal thing to you as a person. As a physiotherapist, one of my jobs was to try and stop the dominoes from falling. If we can either take away the reason for the pain, take away the pressure, or take away the chemicals, or trick the brain into believing that there isn't a problem, then the pain will be decreased. And I just thought this was interesting. These are two brain scans of a person who on the left is experiencing pain and then on the right, a patient whose pain has been eased by either drugs or a particular treatment. So for the second part of this podcast, I wanted to talk to you about what might be useful in controlling your pain as a person with diabetes. One of the common names for pain in diabetes is neuropathic pain. Neuro means nerve and pathy means disease. So this is a condition where the nerves themselves have been affected by the diabetes. And for whatever reason, they either don't work properly or they work too well. And the pain from diabetes is described as a burning or a dull or an ache or a tingling or even an electric shock type pain. I thought it was interesting to just show you this diagram here. So what we can see here is that the nerves are normally surrounded by a very fine network of very small blood vessels. In uncontrolled diabetes, what can happen is that the blood vessels start to become less good, less efficient at supplying the nerve. And in the same way that if we fail to water the garden, the grass will eventually stop growing and die. If we fail to give oxygen and nutrients to the nerve, the nerve will stop working. And this is one of the possible causes for peripheral neuropathy, which is another reason why it's very important that you try and control your diabetes as well as possible. Pain is a huge topic, and when Rama asked me to do this, I thought for a while about the best concepts to talk about. And I've decided to talk about something called the pain gate, which I've tried to illustrate here which in a strange way you already know about but you perhaps didn't realize it if you walk into a table and bang your leg the first thing that you will do is rub your leg that will take away the pain that's closed the pain gate or if you have tummy ache you may sit and rock backwards and forwards very gently that will ease the pain that's closing the pain gate and the pain gate basically says that there is a motorway of nerves going to the brain all the time. There is a limit to how many cars can travel on that motorway. If we can trick the brain into closing off the road, we don't feel the pain. And a lot of the things that we do as physiotherapists involve closing the pain gate. And I've got a few examples of what that might mean for physiotherapy. So quite often what we do as physiotherapists involves touch. And again, this is soothing for most people. Some people don't like to be touched, of course. That's fine. You have to respect people's views. But generally, touch is soothing and it will close the pain gate. So if this person has a sprained ankle, the first thing that we will learn to do as a child is to rub it and to hold it. And that closes the pain gate. And what we're trying to do is close the motorway and stop the pain impulses from getting to the brain. So in a way, we're trying to trick the body. I think it's important for patients to realize that you can also control your own pain gate. And I do understand that this is easier said than done. Um, but it is important also to realize that you can control the amount of pain that you're feeling to a degree. So, for example, we are currently in the middle of the 
COVID lockdown, a lot of people are now complaining of a lot more pain, probably because even though they still have the same condition that they've had for the past five years, they now are focused on that pain. They have no external activities. They have no one to talk to. They have no support mechanisms. They are worried. They are depressed. That will increase pain. If you are suffering from pain, one of the easiest things to do is to either apply heat or cold. Both do the same thing in a strange way. But I do need to warn you to be a little bit careful. If you do have diabetes and you do have neuropathy and you do have the inability to feel sensations such as heat or cold, you have to be very careful if you put a hot water bottle on a part of your body that doesn't have sensation there's a danger that you could burn and I have seen patients in the past who've been in so much pain that they've sat in front of a fire and burned themselves because they couldn't feel the heat from the fire so please 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 be careful if you go to see a physiotherapist they may use some very impressive looking machines which do different things of course but one of the things that they may do is again close the pain gate so this is an example of a treatment called interferential which sends impulses to the nerves which block the pain gate and take away the pain and it can be very dramatic you may go to see a physiotherapist who may do some manipulations on your spine on your neck or your joints again that can be done for various reasons but one of the things that that might do is again close the pain gate and stop this cycle of impulses going to the brain and almost immediately take away the pain sometimes massage although it tends to be temporary can be very effective at relieving somebody's pain it's nice for most people and it closes the pain gate and takes away the person's pain and the final example that I wanted to present to you was this, which is something that I found particularly useful for people with chronic pain. I used to work in rheumatology where I dealt with people who had really severe arthritis that wouldn't respond to other drugs or the drugs that they were being given were having severe side effects. So this is a machine called a TENS unit or a transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation unit. These are really good because they're quite cheap. A person can buy them. You put two sticky electrodes on either side of the pain, in this case, a broken wrist, and you can then go around and go to work and live your life. And apart from a few people who have maybe an allergic reaction to the pads, there are no side effects. And again, it closes the pain gate. And even after you've taken the machine off, sometimes the pain relief can last for quite some time. So that's called a TENS unit. So that concludes this brief podcast on pain. I hope that you found it useful. I hope you stay safe in these times of COVID. And if you have any suggestions for future podcasts, please let Rama or myself know. And I hope to speak to you soon.